this lecture is will be devoted to uh, two examples of on how to apply Pontryagin's maximum principle to solve optimal control problems. In the last lecture, we have introduced a basic class of optimal control problems. This class is made of what? Uh, you have a nonlinear state space state model, x dot equal to f of x in u. u is a manipulated variable and x is the state. And you have some initial condition and you are operating this system during uh, a time span between zero and capital T. Capital T is fixed. So you are operating your system during a uh, fixed time. And uh, at this, during this time, during this period of time, you want to select your manipulated variable u such that at each time t, ut is within some uh, range of values. For instance, uh, you can assume any real value between minus plus and minus infinity. Or to be more realistic, u uh, must be uh, in an interval, for instance, between 0 and 1, or 0 and 100%. For instance, if you have a valve, you say the valve fully closed is 0, the valve fully open is 100%. Who says a valve says, uh, I have an aileron or a surface, uh, a control surface in an aircraft and uh, uh, one extreme position is zero, the other extreme position is one or 100 or whatever you want to qualify. So we have this, these restrictions. And you want to find your function u, defined in this interval between zero and capital T, such as to maximize, such as to maximize, uh this so-called cost function what is this uh, once you have u you can compute uh, this function l this function l should be given i call it the lagrangian or running cost and it's known and uh, uh, i can compute x by integrating the state equation so uh, I have now two functions, u of t and x of t, in the interval between zero and t, I can compute this integral, which is a number. And then I add a function of the final state, which is also another number. So uh, my functional is a number, which is a function of the function u. So this is a funny function, because it's a function that makes functions in real numbers. Uh, for instance, you want to find u that minimizes the energy that you spend during the operat operation time. So the, the total energy is a number, and uh, u is a function between uh, defined during the interval uh, where the operation time occurs. And uh, uh, I told you that uh, to solve these problems, you have a number of uh, conditions. These are necessary conditions. Okay? And these necessary conditions that I have not proved, but I will in, uh, in the next lecture, these conditions amount to what you can see in this slide. So, of course, you have to uh, verify the... Uh, state model. So the optimal u and the opti optimal state, optimal u I call it u, the optimal state I call it x, they must verify the state equation with the initial condition and furthermore u must at each time must belong to the set of admissible values for control capital U. Now you have another entity which is this vector lambda that I called cost state and the cost state must satisfy the uh, joint equation written here with a terminal condition. You see, now uh, where the state has x as an initial condition, the cost state as a terminal condition. And the equation is written here, uh, where 
what I mean by fx and all x and psi x, fx is the Jacobian matrix of x. So it's the matrix of first partial derivatives. And uh, Lx is the gradient of L with respect to vector x. So again, it's uh, a vector, a row vector of partial derivatives of L with respect to x1, x2, etc. And uh, psi x is again a gradient of the function psi with respect to x computed for x equal to x of t. And uh, so you have this triplet x, u, and lambda that must satisfy this set of uh, partial differential equations. x satisfies this one, and lambda satisfies this one. x is with an initial condition, lambda is with a terminal condition. So we call this a two point boundary value problem. You were used to initial value problems in differential equations. Now we are specifying part of the unknowns, the x part in the beginning, and part of the unknowns, the lambda part, in the end of the optimization interval. So this is like, yes? Uh, why is lambda with uh, an apostrophe? Uh, this, this means transposed. Okay? Oh, it's a transposed, okay. It's trans it is a transposed. Okay, okay. Um, and so uh, psi x for uh, the gradient for me is a row vector. Okay, is a row vector. Be careful because in some books uh, there is some confusion about this. For me, the gradient will always be a row vector. So uh, the lambda must be transposed because lambda is a column vector. So it is transposed to be equal to that. And uh, you are uh, also writing things in terms of the transpose of lambda here. So uh, look, f of x is a matrix, and you are multiplying on the left. So you have a row vector times a matrix. That gives you another row vector, OK? Any other question? OK. So don't, be, don't uh, worry about um don't worry about disturbing when you do questions because the idea of having a lecture is to is that we have some interaction otherwise i could uh, just record this uh, lecture and you would see it uh, but uh, we have a little bit more which is the live lecture so always make questions and don't be afraid of the type of question you do any question is pertinent that you do Okay, so uh, we have these conditions, and now we have an extra condition, which is this quantity called the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is a function of lambda, x, and the control. I placed here a v just to uh, emphasize that it may not be the control, the optimal value of the control. So this can be any value of the control within the admissible set. And this function is defined as lambda transposed f, f plus L. And along the optimal trajectory for x, u, and lambda, it must be maximum for v equal to the optimal control. So what was the big trick here? We had the problem of maximizing a function with respect uh, to a function. And this is an infinite dimensional optimization problem. You cannot just go there and differentiate because what is the, diff the derivative with respect to a function? You, you must uh, generalize the sense uh, of derivatives. Now I replace that problem of optimizing with respect to a function to a sequence of problems defined for every t in which for every t you maximize the Hamiltonian with respect to the value of the control at that time instant. It's no longer the full, the full function, but it's only the function u at time e, at time t. And this is a, a scalar quantity in this case. 
so you can uh, use everything that you know about maximizing functions because at time at each time t you uh, are able uh, you what your, your problem consists of maximizing this function h with respect to v and the optimum is the optimal control at that time instant so let's be naive okay let's be naive and actually the first example will be a naive one and the second example will be a non-naive one but even in the naive one it will it will be interesting because the solution is not obvious so let's be naive and what do i mean by being naive suppose that you are able to uh, solve these two differential equations x uh, the equation for x the state equation and the equation for lambda the adjoint equation okay. now you have x and lambda so you plug it here you know the function f you know the function l so you plug uh, the, the optimal value for x for lambda here and you remain with something that depends on u of t and then you maximize h okay why do i say this is a naive approach this is a naive approach because uh, all these conditions in, a, in the interesting problems are entangled that is to say they are mixed together so uh, uh, to find x you need u and to find uh, to to know u you must optimize h and to optimize h you need x okay so this is what we, in Portuguese we call pescadinha de rabo na boca, which is something that I cannot translate in English. Okay, it's a vicious circle, a kind of vicious circle. So, uh, in some cases, you can solve these conditions to get the optimal control explicitly by paper and pencil. That is what we are going to do in this course. When you are not able to do that, uh, then you must use numerical methods. I will briefly mention numerical methods later in this in the course, but uh, uh, for the moment, let's concentrate on trying to solve these conditions in some problems with uh, pencil and paper in your minds, which is the most uh, powerful tool that you can imagine. So we have seen already one example that was a very simple example uh, last uh, in the last in the end of the last lecture. But uh, today let's see two other examples. And uh, so let me go to example. This example one was what we have seen before. Let's go to ex example two. So we have a push card. If you want to give it a better name, you call it a mobile robot, it's much more sexy. So you have your ro mobile robot that moves along a line and uh, you start at some initial condition, let's say that you start at the origin it's material and uh, you, your manipulated variable is the force that you apply, the force U that you apply to and you model the movement of the car by just a double integrator. So you say that the position x1 of the car, if you differentiate it, is the velocity, okay? And then if you uh, differentiate the velocity, you just get the force, okay? This is a kind of uh, normalized version of Newton's law and a very simple condition. So because you, the derivative of the velocity is the acceleration, mass times the acceleration is a force. So imagine that U is the force divided by the mass of the car and there are no other moving parts. So your state equations are just these two, x1 dot equal to x2, x2 dot equal to U. So uh, if you uh, remember our uh, standard way of writing state equations, so F1 is x2 and F2 is U. Now, what is the what is the cost functional? Well, the system is the system, and the, the engineer has to model the system, but uh, it has it has not much degrees of freedom. But 
when it comes to uh, finding out what is the the cost function that you are optimizing actually you don't find it out you select one that meets your problem okay and in this problem i want to uh, optimize the position at the end of the operation interval okay so i want to go as far away as possible so i want to maximize x1 at for t equal to the terminal time capital t uh, but then i i will put uh, a regularization term uh, which is a penalty on the square of u okay so the square of the force is related to to the power and this is if you integrate the power you have the energy so this term here is proportional to the energy that you are spending uh, i have one weight which is one half and i put a minus here because uh, i want to maximize this sum so maximizing the distance is maximizing the distance but maximizing minus the energy is minimizing the energy okay so when you want to, to transform the minimization uh, minimization problem into a maximization problem you just had a minus so in this problem you have a kind of two objective combined in one okay so it's a multi-objective problem and you combine these two objectives of maximizing the distance and minimizing the energy into this uh, cost functional okay you, you could have used otherwise actually there is a there is a, a person called ross he was for many years consultant consultant to nasa and he has a very nice uh, book on uh, optimal control and uh, inter it's an introductory book on optimal control but it's quite deep and quite interesting uh, it's called a primer on optimal control if you want to know and uh, he has many papers and in one of those papers he discusses how you formulate the control of spacecraft optimal control for doing maneuvers with sp spacecraft for instance uh, positioning uh, a satellite or a spacecraft that goes to repair the hubble telescope and uh, he said well what about the cost functional you consider all possible cost functionals that you uh, can imagine and you do a lot of simulations and analysis and perhaps you start combining them and so on uh, to find the best one okay so uh, specifying the, the cost functional is a way of translating your control objectives your engineering objectives okay so in this case we are given the cost function that's nice this is one so you can see that this cost functional has two parts one part that is the running cost you would be tempted to say it's u squared well don't forget the minus one half so the cost function our l function is minus one half of u squared and then we have uh, the part that depends on the final state. So our psi of x of t is just x1 of t, the first component of the state at the final position. Okay. So what, what are we going to do? We are going to apply Pontryagin's maximum conditions to this problem. Bearing in mind, bearing in mind, let's put again once more. okay so uh I, I will give you 10 seconds so that you can copy to your to piece of paper the standard form okay remember that you have psi of xt plus integral of l of xu okay so write it on a piece of paper because we are going to use to use this once 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 and twice and so on usually i write it on the blackboard okay now let's start by applying the uh by applying Pontryagin's principle 
conditions of Montreal's principle. Well, one thing that we need is the Jacobian matrix of matrix F. Remember that F is X2 and U. So the Jacobian is this matrix here, the F1, the X1, the F1, the X2, and so on. And it's very simple to see that the Jacobian matrix actually is constant. That's a good thing for us to do the computations. It's just 0, 1, 0, 0. Now, and now we are going to uh, write the adjoint equation. Now, we have our cost, okay? And uh, remember that the psi function of the general cost is x1. So uh, remember that x has two components. So psi of x is the psi dx1, which is one. And then the psi dx2, which is zero, because psi does not depend on x2. Now, in the last uh, uh, lecture, one of you told me, well, but psi of x t is x1 of t. This is a number. How can you differentiate it? Well, think of this number as x1 of a general t for t equal to capital T. Okay, that's that. That's the idea. That, that is the sense in which I'm computing this, uh, this uh, uh, gradient. And the gradient is also, this is a short notation for uh, the gradient with respect to x at a general x of t for t equal to capital T, or for x equal to x of capital T. In this case, it's very simple, just one zero. Now, okay, since we are, uh, we also need the gradient of L with respect to X. And since L does not depend on X, the gradient is just a vector zero, zero. So uh, in Pontryagin's principle, we have the joint equation that I have written here, omitting the arguments. Remember that this should be this should be valid along the uh, optimal passes for u, x, and lambda. And uh, <clears throat> so I have minus the transpose of the derivatives of lambda, which is he written here, okay? Minus lambda one dot, minus lambda two dot. And it's a row vector because it's transposed. Then I have lambda transpose, lambda one, lambda two. And then I have the fx, that I have just computed in the previous slide. And then L, Lx is not there because it, Lx is zero, zero. Now expand this, the, this product and write, you have two separate equations, which is just lambda one dot equal to zero and lambda two dot equals to minus lambda one. So these two equations come from this matrix equation here. Now, remember that the final values of lambda are given by the gradient of the final cost psi of x uh, for x equal to xt. So this is one zero. So the final values of lambda are just lambda one of capital T is one, lambda two of capital T is zero, okay? So you have these two equations with these two terminal conditions and they are very simple to solve. Uh, let's see the next slide. So uh, look at the first one, lambda dot, lambda one dot equal to zero. And then you have that lambda one uh, at the final point is one. Now, if lambda one dot is zero, it's because lambda one is constant. The derivative is, is uh, the derivative is zero of a constant. Now, which constant? You apply the terminal conditions. You know that at the terminal point, lambda one is one, so the constant must be one. So lambda one is always equal to one for everything. Now, look at the equation for lambda two. The equation for lambda two is lambda two dot equal to minus lambda one. But lambda one, we have came to the conclusion that it's one. So lambda two dot is minus one. Now you integrate it. And uh, lambda two is a constant minus the primitive of one, which is t. Okay, the derivative of t is one. So 
when you integrate one, you get p. Now, what is the value of this other constant? Well, again, we have the terminal condition, lambda 2 of t equal to 0. So, uh, if you apply this condition, you know that for t equal to 0, uh, uh, sorry, for t equal to capital T, we know that the constant minus capital T is 0. So, this constant must, must be capital T. Okay? And so, we have uh, lambda 1, which is always 1, and lambda 2, which is capital T minus the running time T. So we, we were lucky in this case because we could compute the, uh, the cost state lambda, the solution of the adjoint equation. Now, let's look at the Hamiltonian. We must maximize the Hamiltonian at each time T with respect to u. We must maximize h with respect to u at each time. Now, this is a quadratic function in u, you see. Uh, actually, uh, you can see that uh, it has a maximum because uh, the first derivative of h with respect to u, partial derivative of h with respect to u, is nothing more. Well, this term does not depend on u, so the derivative is zero. Then you have lambda 2, and then you have minus u, because it's minus 2 times 1 half times u. And the second derivative is you differentiate lambda 2 minus what u, and it's minus 1. So you have a function which is a parabola turned upside down, so it has a maximum. Okay? So uh, if you compute the zero of the derivative, you will actually get a maximum. And the zero of the derivative is u equal to lambda 2. But we could compute lambda 2 before, and we know that it was capital T minus t. So the optimal value of u is capital T minus t, and we could get the optimal control, which is by no means obvious. Probably you would expect the function to be a decreasing function, because uh, you, Suppose that you were applying an increasing function, more force at the end than at the beginning. The force that you apply at the end will serve to uh, earn space uh, in future times after the optimization, the, the optimization interval has ended. So when you are no longer operating the car. So you should apply the biggest force at the beginning and then perhaps decreasing because if you increase the force, you are just wasting energy to uh, make the vehicle go faster, but then you have no time to transform this velocity, this incrementing velocity, to transform it in space because time has ended. Okay? But so it's, it's not so difficult to come to the conclusion uh, using heuristic arguments that the optimal use should be decreasing. But should it be a straight line? Should it be a parabola? Should it be anything else? Well, uh, Pontryagin's principle point to this solution. Actually, this is remember that Pontryagin's is a necessary condition for uh, it's a necessary condition for optimality. Don't forget that. But in this case, it's actually uh, the optimal solution. Now, you could have considered other cost functions, as I mentioned in the beginning. For instance, instead of minimizing the square of u, which is proportional to the uh, energy, total energy, you, you could use this so-called minimum fool. Imagine that u is uh, the rate of consumption of fuel that is proportional to force. And uh, you want to minimize the, this is the rate of, of consumption of fuel. So if you integrate it, what you get is the total consumption of fuel. So you want to maximize the distance, but achieving a compromise with minimizing the consumption of fuel. And in this case, uh, I assume that my U is bounded. So there is a U bar, which is the maximum value for U. And uh, I, I'm also assuming that capital T is 
bigger than one, of course. I could have considered smaller values, uh, but the solution would be slightly different to the other, still be achieved. But let's consider in this case where capital T is bigger than one. Now, the cost state is as before. It does not change the expressions for the cost state. But the Hamiltonian now changes because the Hamiltonian is lambda transposed F, okay, that's the same, but then you have plus L. And L is the running cost is minus U, as you see here. So it's no longer minus one half of U squared. So now we have a function which is a linear function of, on U. And uh, uh, let's plot H as a function of U. Let's do a sketch. What do you have? Uh, remember that uh, this is a straight line of slope lambda two minus one, and lambda two changes with time. Okay, so this slope is changing. What are the situations, the case in which lambda two is bigger than one, in which you have a positive slope, or the situation in which you have lambda two smaller than one, in which you have a negative slope. And uh, if you want to maximize the Hamiltonian, uh, in this case, if this is the case, if lambda two is bigger than one, then the optimal value that maximizes the Hamiltonian is, is U bar. Remember that now you, you have a constraint uh, set of possible ranges for u. Okay, these are between zero and u bar. This interval gives you the set of possible values. So the maximum of h of the Hamiltonian within the range of possible values is a shift for u equal to u bar. Now, if lambda two is smaller than one, then the, the maximum is for u equal to zero. Now. Uh, Fortunately, in this case, we could solve lambda two, and lambda two is something which is uh, which is uh, a straight line starting from the point uh, capital T for uh, small t equal to zero, and achieving zero for small t equal to capital T. So it's this straight line. Now you uh, plot the line, the constant line equal to one. So before lambda two is bigger than one, so you are in this situation, the optimal control is U bar. So up to this time, marked by the red line, uh, the optimal control is U bar here, yeah, constant. And then lambda two becomes smaller than one, so you switch to the other situation, okay? And in this other situation, the optimal U is zero. So your optimal control now is uh, piecewise constant. So you have uh, one value here and one value there. And before you have the maximum volume of u, and then you have zero. Uh, sometimes people call this bang bang control because you use the, the, either the maximum or the minimum of the control. Now, which Time is this in which you should switch the control. That's an important thing. Well, it is when lambda two minus one is zero, but lambda two is t minus this switching time. So the switching time is t minus one, okay? Now, you can see that uh, if t uh, is smaller than one, then you would always be at a maximum, no switching at all. That's the situation I ruled out so that I could do this plot. Okay, so uh, in the, using the previous, the quadratic cost, we got a continuous control. And using the, uh, this kind of linear, sorry, this linear cost in U, I got a bang bang control. Bang bang control are quite nice, for instance, when you have a spacecraft. Because uh, when you have a spacecraft, 
uh, you would like just instead of being of always spending fuel, uh, you want to go uh, from uh, the Earth to Jupiter, and you cannot go always pss, spending fuel. Okay, acting the jets. So uh, with bank bank control, sometimes you do a jet pss, and then you stop. And then again, you do another maneuver and you will always do at the maximum, pss, and then you stop, okay? So it's a, um, a sparse control in the sense that it's only non-zero for limited values of time. So this has to do with the type of problem that you are in a, depends on the cost. So the, the other example I, will, I would like to present to you is a model of a penicillin uh, fermentation reactor. Now, uh, in, we are approaching summer and uh, hopefully we'll be able to walk along and sometimes uh, there are some summer rains and uh, you feel a particular smell of the of the of the land of wetland it has a particular smell when you uh, when it rains after after a period in which it's no longer raining and this smell uh, maybe you don't know but it's penicillin so there are uh, fungi in the there are fungi in the in the soil that produce small amounts of penicillin and this this uh, the smell that uh, most of us enjoy is actually the smell of penicillin. So uh, penicillin is quite important. It, it was uh, in the in the wars, for instance, in the before the Second World War and before the invention of penicillin, uh, soldiers could die of infections. Most uh, the most serious uh, cause of uh, this was infections due to wounds. Even very small wounds could infect and you could not do anything and people were dying in tremendous ways. Um, it was, uh, penicillin was discovered a little bit by chance by a researcher called Fleming in the 20s of the 20th century, of the 20th century. So about uh, a little less than uh, 100 years ago about 98 years ago or something like that. And um, so what we have in a penicillin fermentation reactor, we have, uh, imagine a big pan, a big pan, okay? Uh, not a pan that you use to cook potatoes, but a much larger pan. These pans can have, uh, say, more than 10 meters high. And uh, you have an agitator, Okay, and you have a broth. You have a broth. So you have a liquid. You have a liquid in which uh, you have a number of nutrients. And uh, in these nutrients, you inoculate uh, a bit of uh, fungi. And these fungi, they multiply, and they produce penicillin. Now, I will call. I will call. Uh, the concentration of fungi capital X and the concentration of penicillin they produce capital P. Okay, now how can I control this? Well, there are a number of, of controllers. For instance, I need to uh, keep the pH index uh, constant, but uh, I will not speak about that. I also need to keep the temperature uh, regulated because uh, it's an ex exothermic uh, reaction, so it liberates energy. So I have a uh, jacket around the reactor where cold water circulates to remove this uh, heat being generated by the activity of the fungi. And, uh, but I will also not speak about temperature control. Uh, I will speak about uh, or maximizing the penicillin production. And for that, you have a manipulated variable, which is the rate of addition of nutrients. So imagine that you have a solution 
con that contains sugar, okay? Uh, corn steep liquor, for instance, that's, that's one example. And uh, you add this sugar, and the sugar is used by the fungi to grow and for activity and then to produce penicillin. Okay? So what is the what is the model that relates U, X, and P? Now, this is a very simplified model of, of the fermentation. So you assume that the rate of growth of the fungi is proportional to the fungi itself, but the, the constant of proportionality is not a constant. It's there is a constant B and the concentration of nutrients, the addition of the rate of addition of nutrients. So they grow more when you add more uh, nutrients. And you can uh, use a valve to regulate this uh, rate of addition of nutrients U. And then you have what we might call a mortality of fungi, if we can use this word. So they become be inactive by one reason or another at a rate which is minus mu. And then the penicillin, the rate of production of penicillin is proportional to the number of fungi, but the coefficient of proportionality is one minus the uh, one minus the rate of addition of the substract of nutrients. Okay, and C is a constant. Now, uh, a number of, of comments about this model. First, well, this model actually is, uh, if you want to make a consultancy uh, contract with, an, with a penicillin factory, for instance, CIPA in Portugal, uh, this is not a good model. But usually, what is, what is the difference to a good model? This, um, these uh, uh, coefficients, the rates of, of change uh, are much more complicated. Uh, the price is that you are no longer able to solve the problem with pencil and paper. However, this model captures the essential thing that you see. If you want to make the penicillin, the penicillin fungi to grow, the, the fungi to grow, you add a lot of nutrients. But uh, when you add a lot of nutrients, you are decreasing the rate of production at which they produce penicillin. So there is a trade-off, okay? Let's assume that you cannot is normalized between zero and one. That's why there is a one here. So U equal to zero means no nutrients being, being added, but a maximum rate of production of penicillin. U equal to one means the maximum rate of uh, of uh, growth of the fungi, but no production of penicillin. So uh, a strategy you might think that might be in qualitative terms. First, you use u high so that uh, x grows, and when you have uh, an appreciate uh, an amount. Uh, that is considered to be su sufficient of fungi, then you cut U to zero and you let the fungi die and make the penicillin to grow at maximum speed. So the optimal control is something which is uh, decreasing somehow. But how should it be decreasing? What are the values? We don't know again. So let me. Let me uh, put some numbers here. These numbers have no no connection with reality. Just just some numbers, okay? So I put this coefficient equal to one, mu equal to 0.5, and c equal to one also. So uh, suppose that I have an initial condition which is x of zero is one in some units, say inoculus, the concentration of the initial inoculus and no penicillin at all at the beginning. And our objective is to operate the reactor during some fixed time, so between zero and capital T, and to find the optimal 
control, that is to say the optimal uh, uh, profile for the addition of nutrients, UT, so that my final amount of penicillin is maximum. Okay? And now I have a constraint. My capital U set is the interval between zero and one. At each time, you must be between zero and one. So let's apply, apply the Contriagin's principle. So remember that the cost functional, the general cost function is this one. So clearly, in this case, L is zero because we have no running cost. We are only concerned with the final state and the component P of the final state. So don't get confused because this small x in this case is capital X and P. Okay? You have a state which is made of capital X and capital P. Uh, so uh, the gradient of the of the function psi, the function psi is nothing more than P. And the gradient P depends only on the second on the second uh, state variable. So the first derivative, the derivative with respect to x1 is zero. That's the derivative with respect to capital X. And the derivative with respect to P is one. Okay, so this is the gradient of psi with respect to x, which is actually gives you, if you remember, the final uh, values of the cost state. Now, let's write the cost state equation. Uh, now, L is zero, so Lx is just a vector of zeros. F is the set of, is the vector made of these two functions. So if you compute the partial derivatives of F with respect to X, you, you just get this matrix here, okay? So, uh, Lx is zero, Fx is given by this matrix. L lambda, remember, is lambda one, lambda two, is a column vector, is a row vector. So uh, if you write this equation, if you plug these expressions into this equation and you expand the components, you get these two equations with these two terminal conditions that came from uh, psi of x. Now, for lambda two, lambda two, dot is zero, so lambda two is constant, and you know that lambda two final is one. Okay, that's nice, because lambda two will always be one, so you can plug it there, okay? And now we have the equation for lambda one, which is this one, and we know that lambda two is one. Now, we have one problem. We have one problem, which is, the equation for lambda one depends on you. But U depends on the Hamiltonian that depends on lambda. Okay? But lambda depends on U and so on. So we have this vicious circle. How can we solve it? Okay. At this point, if I were uh, in a classroom with a blackboard, I would suggest you to think about these things. Uh, but uh, now I, I will go straight to the solution. So let's write the Hamiltonian. If you write the Hamiltonian in terms of lambda one and lambda two, and using the, the particular f and del, well, l is zero, so it's not here. So we end up with a function. You can you can uh, 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 put this term here in u, this term here here in u together. You collect them and you write h in this way. And uh, let's assume that X is positive. So the concentration of fungi is positive. So H is nothing more than uh, a linear function of U. So if you think of the graphic of H with respect to U, then you can see that this is a straight line. If it is a straight line, you know that uh, the control is going to be bang, bang. So you have this, these two situations. If the slope, if the slope uh, 
uh, of h with respect to u that is lambda one minus one if it is negative so if lambda one is smaller than one then you have a decreasing function and the optimal control is zero if the slope is positive lambda one minus, minus one positive then lambda one bigger than one then h as a function of u is some straight line going upwards so the optimal control that maximizes h with respect to u is just the maximum value of u let's assume it's one it is one was assumed to be one now uh, at this point at this moment you know that the control is just made of zeros and one so either you completely cut the you completely cut the addition of nutrients or you add nutrients at full rate when should you do that now it happens that close to the end of the interval you know you know that lambda one of t is zero that's the final condition on lambda one so there must be some period of time in which lambda one is also zero in this situation lambda one is smaller than one because it is zero and the, according to the previous slide the optimal control should be zero if the optimal control should be zero the equation reduces to this one that you can solve using the techniques that we studied in the first part of this course and the solution is this one so if you go backwards you have a situation in which u is zero and lambda one starts to be less than one and if you go back backwards this is a decreasing function of t but if you go backwards it's increasing and approaching approaching one when it, it touches one what happens you have a switch and then u becomes one and you have another form of the equation for lambda okay and this switch happens this switch happens when lambda one for which you have an expression is just one and you can solve it with respect to ts in this case it's t minus 1.79 so the solution that you have is something like this you have lambda that going backwards okay going backwards it increases 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 so your optimal control is zero in this region and maximum in that region okay this technique of going backwards is classical of, of dynamic optimization problems professor yes uh, why is lambda equal to one in the switching time okay because that's Pontryagin's principle that tell you just a moment so uh, remember that the final value of lambda is the gradient of psi with respect to x at the final value and uh, this gives you this gives me the lambda one this is the final value of lambda one and this is the final value of lambda two okay let's go back to the to the slide with Pontryagin's principle okay you see this equation here yeah. the final value of lambda is uh, given by the gradient of the terminal cost with respect to x for x equal to the terminal state okay that comes from this condition okay 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 and then okay. by continuity close to that that point i'm assuming that it is still uh, it's not zero but it's small that's my argument okay yes yes So uh, the situation that you have is this now. You can integrate your state equation uh, with this optimal control. And what you get, you get P started at zero. When you have the maximum, you have no production at all of penicillin. And you have a gross, actually it's an exponential gross of the, 
biomass of X of the concentration of fungi. Now you switch your control to zero. The rate of production of penicillin is maximum and X decreases according to the equation. Now it's just a, remember that there was a negative term associated to this. Now you could have done another thing, which is uh, do a lot of simulations with this stuff, varying the switching time. So sometimes uh, you switch it uh, before, sometimes you switch it after, and record the final number uh, of the total penicillin in the end. So uh, this means that you can plot the total production of penicillin as a function of the switching time by doing a lot, a lot of simulations. And you get this, this result. If you compare this maximum, this maximum occurs for the best possible switching time, is actually exactly what we could get by Potjagin's principle. Now, you could say, why not to do this instead of having those apparatus, those endless apparatus with lots of derivatives of Potjagin's principle? It happened that Potjagin's principle told you more. Potjagin's principle told you that the optimal control is bang bang okay and uh, once it is bang bang it was very easy to compute this uh, number actually the computa in computational terms uh, Pontiagin's principle is very simple uh, here i'm assuming that it is bang bang but who tells me that it's not bang bang that i have some um, some uh, intermediate values for instance or I have more than one switching uh, inter uh, instant. It could happen. Okay, so I I did not know that before applying Pontryagin's principle. So this closes uh, these two examples.